My name is Elizabeth Daly, and I will be moderating tonight's um, events. I want to say a special welcome to the folks who have come over from the EDIC meeting, where they have been advocating against the eviction of Joy um, childcare from the Blood Building. Um, I wish them best of luck with that endeavor. I hope you've all had a chance to jot down your own thoughts and questions on the wall posters around the room and that you've also taken the opportunity to talk with the candidates before we get started tonight. The comments that are written on the posters will be typed up and will be shared with all of the candidates after tonight. I'd like to thank the six candidates for Council at Large for joining us tonight. We know you have busy schedules. In fact, two of the Council at Large candidates, Buzzy Barton and Richard Ford, are not able to join us tonight, but we appreciate those of you who have come. The New Lynn Coalition Forum will focus tonight on issues that affect the majority working class of Lynn, issues that have not received enough attention as yet during this campaign. These are the issues of housing, jobs, and immigration. The New Lynn Coalition, whose membership is comprised of unions and community organizations, is working to build a new Lynn. The New Lynn Coalition worked successfully to secure financing for the Lower Washington Street Gateway Project from the AFL-CIO Housing Investment Trust. The project will be made of mixed-use retail and housing, and it will include mixed-income units. It will also be built entirely with union labor. In addition, the New Lynn Coalition negotiated a community benefits agreement with the project's developer through which we've been able to create the Lynn Community Enrichment Program within the Lynn School Department. This program provides adult education classes that range from cake decorating, to yoga, to oil burner tech certification, to citizenship classes for hundreds of Lynners at the Lynn Tech School. In the near future, the new Lynn Coalition will be introducing a new wage theft ordinance. The ordinance will help prevent employers that are licensed by or have contracts with the city from cheating their workers out of the minimum wage, overtime pay, or other legally required benefits. By next year, we also plan to, do, to introduce an inclusionary zoning ordinance that will address Lynn's soaring rents and property taxes and help to stop the displacement crisis that is facing Lynners. We hope that, this, that tonight's discussion and this year's elections will result in leadership that is committed to improve the city we love for all of Lynn's residents. I want to thank Seth Album, who is taping um, the forum tonight, and you will be able to find it on lynnhappens.com um, via YouTube. Each candidate will be asked to give a one-minute opening statement. Then, each candidate will be asked to answer three different questions. They will be given two minutes for the answers to those questions. Toward the end, we will have a series of quick yes or no questions, and then each candidate will make a one-minute closing statement. The candidates are seated in order, alphabetical order, by last name. And the first response will rotate as we go through the different questions. Maria Carrasco, sitting in the front row here, will be our timer. And she'll let the candidates know when they have <laughs> She'll let the candidates know when they have 30 seconds left. Want to show your 30 second card? I made a mistake. That's 30 seconds. And then the red card is when you are out of time. We ask all the candidates to respect the time limits because they will be strictly enforced by me. Um, are there any questions at this point from the audience? Can you slow down just a bit for All right. She asked me to slow down just a bit for those who are doing the translation, so I hope everyone can keep that in mind. 
um, the candidates might, might not be able to slow down that much. All right. So our first question is one here. My name is Jamie Figueroa, and I was born in Bayamón, Puerto Rico. At eight months old, my family and I moved to Massachusetts. I was raised in Boston South End, and in 2000, my family and I were displaced. We bounced around for a few years, and in 2003, we ended up here in Lynn. I attended North Shore Classic, I mean, sorry, Lake Classical High School, and eventually dropped out. I worked for various employers and decided I needed to do better. I enrolled at North Shore Community College, where I quickly became active in my community and became Vice President of Student Government. I graduated there with a scholarship to go to Suffolk University, and at Suffolk I'll graduate cum laude with a business degree. I am running to give kids like me hope. Hope that there is a way out. Hope that you can always bounce back and become greater. Hope that your past doesn't define you, but your intentions do. Hope to hope that my... Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I wish we got two minutes. Thank you all very much. Good evening all. My name is John Ladd. I'm a lifelong resident of Lynn. I attended Lynn Public Schools and I'm also a business owner in the city. I've also been selling real estate in Lynn for the past 15 years. I've been a member of the, North, uh, the Lynn Area Chamber of Commerce for many years, also a member of the Massachusetts and North Shore Association of Realtors. I'm hoping everybody watching this evening will leave here tonight with a clear understanding of my goals and views for the city if elected on November 7th. I also want to thank the New Lynn Coalition for inviting us all tonight, and more importantly, I want to thank all of you very much for taking the time to sit and listen to our views tonight. And again, I'm hoping it's helpful for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, everyone, and thank you, Lynn Coalition, for hosting us this evening. And uh, what a great turnout to see so many people, champions of our community, I would say. You are empowering, and uh, it is a wonderful uh, opportunity to share with you some of my views this evening as your counselor at large. And uh, just so honored to have my family with me as well tonight. And uh, I look forward to really uh, getting into some of the issues that you, could, you, that you care about uh, the most and are concerned about throughout our great city of Lynn. It's, uh, as you may know, um, I was born and raised here. Uh, I went to school here. And I'm a community leader, a husband, a father, a taxpayer. And uh, I see a lot of tremendous opportunities in this city. And I want the city of Lynn to reach its full potential with all of us in this room. Because all of us in this room bring together the power of the voice to move the city forward for the next two and four years respectively, and I'm happy to be on that ride with you, and I hope you'll continue to support me as your counselor at large. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening, my name is Hong Nat, the proud city councilor. I was born in Cambodia. I came here as a, a teenager. I went to college, got a degree, and I went back to Cambodia to help um, my country and came back uh, in 97 and um, uh, taught immigration and uh, citizenship classes and um, also counseled uh, kids who were got involved in the wrong, the wrong side. And we moved to Lynn in uh, 98, got married with my wife. We bought our first home, had two children, and they both in the public schools. Um, got elected 2011, and I uh, just want uh, to let the kids know that if I can do, they all can do that the same like me, and don't think what you cannot do, think what you can do. Um, just want to encourage everybody to get involved. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. I look forward to the conversation. Good evening. My name is Council Nicolakopoulos. Born in Greece, moved here in 1974 with my parents. Grew up in downtown Lynn. Went to the Greek bilingual school at Washington Community School. Uh, didn't see my parents for the first five years because they were laborers. My father worked, both worked in a leather factory. Um, moved to uh, Robin Street in West Lynn. Attended Sacred Heart School, St. Mary's. Went on to St. Joseph's College. My family started a business called John's Roast Beef and Seafood, which is still, still going on today and I operate it today. We're the American dream. We're, I was you 30, 40 years ago, my family. Didn't speak language, we used our church to communicate and, and, and trusted people around us and we were very lucky. I've had a business now in Lynn for, for 40 years with my family and it's time for me to give back. What I want to do for you, I want to create jobs. I want to bring back 25,000 jobs that are gone for the last 40 years and we haven't replaced it. I want opportunities for everyone. Through job training, bring back manufacturing for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Here we have a series of questions on some of the new Lynn Coalition issues. Um, our first question, if people want to come up and you can ask it from the podium here. Juan. Juan. And Bob. And Bob. Come on up. Come right up here. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Juan Antonio González. Uh, yo represento en estos momentos a ECO, la organización que trabaja con los comunitarios. Y quiero hacer la siguiente pregunta a nuestros candidatos. Este, en una ciudad santuario, eh, acerca de la ciudad santuario una ordenanza de la ciudad santuario asegura que oficiales de la, de la ley local no trabajarán eh, con fuerzas federales de inmigración para retener eh, residentes sin documentos esto va de acuerdo con la decisión de la corte judicial suprema de Massachusetts la cual determina que es inconstitucional que la policía local haga el trabajo de los oficiales federales de, la, de migración. Una ordenanza de Ciudad Santuario ayudaría a mantener una relación de confianza entre los oficiales de la ley local y los residentes haciendo de Lin una segura, una ciudad más segura para todos los eh, habitantes. ¿Ustedes apoya, apoyarían una ordenanza de Ciudad Santuario para poder asegurar una relación de confianza entre los oficiales de la ley y los residentes de Lin? ¿Qué ustedes incluirían en esta ordenanza? ¿Qué específicamente ustedes harían para hacer pasar esta ordenanza? Espero que cada uno pueda responder. Dispensen, disculpen que es, uh, se lo tuve que hacer en español. Mi compañero lo va a hacer en inglés. Gracias. My name is Bob Reynolds. Uh, like Owen, I represent ECHO on the Newland Coalition Board. Um, a sanctuary city ordinance ensures that local law enforcement will not work 
with federal immigration forces in detaining undocumented residents. This is in line with the recent Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court decision, which determined that it is unconstitutional for local police to do the job of federal immigration officials. The sanctuary ordinance would help to maintain a trusting relationship between local law enforcement and residents, making Lynn safer for all of us. Do you support a sanctuary city ordinance in order to ensure a trusting relationship between law enforcement and Lynn residents? And what would that include? And what specifically would you do to enact such an ordinance? <laughs> Thank you, Juan and Bob, and our first respondent will be Kenneth and Figueroa. Thank you. Bob and Juan, thank you for the question. Everyone, thank you for the question. So, trust between the police and the community, that is something that starts with the community. Land of a Thousand Hills Coffee Shop does that now. They host monthly Coffee with the Cop discussion series where it solidifies their involvement in the community and further enhances the relationship they have with us. I attended an immigration meeting at a local church where the police promised the Latino community that we, they will protect and serve them. Our police are already doing it. They're doing their job. The Lynn Police Department is doing a whole lot more with a lot less. We should be thinking of ways to fund the police and not add to their workload. We cannot pick and choose which laws to follow. The issue is a balancing act between public safety and morality. The number one job of the council is to support and advance the interests of its citizens. It's our number one priority. An issue like this one is as complex as it is divisive and polarizing, and much, and much too important for a matter just for a mem uh, an 11 body member of the Lynn City Council to decide. It's a matter that should be a referendum on the ballot, like it is in Salem, and let the people decide. We should let the citizens of Lynn decide, and that's why I stand on that question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Sanctuary City is an extremely hot topic in Lynn right now, as well as across the state. While I respect and support the need for an open, transparent dialogue between the residents and local law enforcement. And many may not agree with me on this topic. I feel at this time we cannot become a sanctuary city. However, this topic is not as black and white as it's put up to, put up to see. The fact of the matter is, if we have undocumented, sorry, if we have undocumented residents in the city that are getting an education, working hard, <coughs> engaged in their community, their neighbors, Obeying the law, I absolutely feel there's no reason that these individuals should be singled out. And my main concern at this time, if we were to become a sanctuary city, is the potential federal funding loss that the city would face would be devastating. We need to think of the betterment of the city as a whole, and I do agree with Jamie that this should be put up to a vote to the residents of the city. This is clearly just where I stand on it at this point. I know this is a sensitive topic for a lot of people, and I do wish there was an easier answer, but at this time, there's really not. In the city's current financial situation, I just can't. I just can't support it at this time. Thank you. Can I end up here? Thank you. So, I think, uh, as my colleagues have said, uh, the sanctuary city ordinance is one piece of a more complex puzzle. I believe. I think, in following this and what I know of it, there are several different tracks that this could take. One in particular is the Safe Communities Act at the State House level. I'd like to see what comes out of that bill. It's been filed by Senator Eldridge of uh, Acton, and it has broad support uh, from Democrats on the House and Senate side, and a lot of co-sponsors. So I don't think we should uh, sort of race into a discussion uh, or, or say that the ordinance is the be-all and end-all, because I don't think we get anywhere that way. I noticed that last March when we had the two schools for Lynn proposal that went down in flames because we didn't educate on a grassroots level, one-on-one -on -one conversations in this room, and then branching out to the greater Lynn community without having 
a real specific ask and what we want of our community. I don't want to impede law enforcement's job to get the job done. I certainly don't want to make, have criminals on our streets. I want to be respectful, of course, of the Constitution and all of the rights we, we have and are protected by. But at the same time, we need to have in-depth conversations. And frankly, I think in other communities like Somerville and Boston and Cambridge that have adopted these such causes and sanctuary ordinances, they've been driven from the mayor's office. We need to know what the corner office leadership is going to bring out to us. And then this council can affirm or reject that. But we need to do that collectively. And I don't believe Thank we should you. put it on the ballot. Thank you. It's too divisive. Thank you. Councilor Ned. My heart is with um, our people who are trying to find a good life here. I was one of them. But I think that I came here uh, legally. But I feel that uh, why they want to come here because of the war and the starvation and the uh, execution that happened in uh, the country I was born as well. And at the same time, my, my head says that because of uh, so much burden uh, with, uh, on our police officers, on our residents, on students, and I, I, I think that uh, we should, we should uh, discuss much further in this and uh, work with the police, work with the ECHO, and um, I, I, uh, I had to with ECHO, so we encourage them to uh, put petition so we can work on this, and uh, like Brian said, we have to work with um, the corner's office as well. As city councilor, I learned that we have to, our heart and mind have to come somewhere between to meet uh, what people need, and we are here. Our job is here to help people, to make everybody um, live peacefully, happily, and have, uh, raise our families, and, and, and um, we, we have to live side by side. So this way, I think we should have the uh, resident decide. And at the same time, we will have to find ways to make it easy for our residents to understand what the beneficial for becoming a sanctuary city. And I have talked to someone from what, in Washington, D.C. who is going for Bill Clinton. And he promised me he will find someone to come to the city council to speak for us so that we can find a better way how we, uh, we work about this so that we don't have uh, confusion. But my heart with them and my mind my, my also think about the difficulty as well. But I don't see this, uh, anything, any obstacle. But I do not support the criminal department. Just want to make clear. I do not support it. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this is coming from an immigrant. As soon as I decided to run for Councilor Lodge, I needed to inform myself of what Sanctuary City is and what it means. So I asked our officials, our own leaders. I could never get a straight answer. You know, should we go for Sanctuary City or not? What are the benefits and what are the drawbacks? And then I asked, and then I asked residents. Not enough, but I need to hear from the residents. I can't decide what my, my personal views are. I want to know what your personal views are. That's what a legislator does. If you elect me, I need to hear from you first. But I, but I ask police officers this when I interview them. Are we breaking up families? They assure me no. We're not breaking up families. Not in the 30-year history of the Lynn Police Force that one guy says I, we haven't broken up a family. That's important to me, number one. Number two, are we removing criminals off the street? He says now more than ever we are removing more criminals off the street. And that's important to me, too, because I want a safe community. And again, third, now when they're applying for grants, first of all, does anybody know what's going on in Washington, D.C.? Because I can't keep track. One week we're doing one thing, and the other week we're changing things. And now when you're writing grants in the city of Lynn, you know there's a question now on a grant. It wasn't there before. But now during the Trump administration, there's a question. It's called, are you a sanctuary city, yes or no? Now, do I want to hurt the city financially and remove money, grant money, that we're already in debt, $8 million? I don't want to take that chance. I do believe we should put a referendum out, because you're the voice. You're going to speak through me. If I hear from you, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to fight for you. It's what you want, and that's what I'll stand for. But I can't make that decision today, because there's so many unclear, so many moving parts to this. I wish I could give you a clear answer today. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and. It, it, it's, it's certainly an emotional question.
question for, for many um, that, that go to about each day in fear. Children, um, immigrants that are hard workers. Uh, and me personally, I take a, a more religious approach. That's the way I was, I was raised by my parents and grandparents. Um, I attended an immigrant church. I was in old St. Michael's uh, Catholic school attendee. And, and I know the struggles from years past where everybody kind of looked alike, but they spoke a different language. And each immigrant community uh, learned in their own church to begin. Uh, St. Jean de Baptiste, where they spoke French. And St. Michael's, where the Polish was the main language. And, and, and many different communities throughout this same city, uh, all religious based, uh, before they went into high school. And it, it's, it's a little different now because there are more folks here from Latino countries and, and Island Creole and, and Southeast Asian communities. And now they don't look the same, if you will. It's, it, there's a mix, and it's a good mix. And Lynn has always been a welcoming community, and it's always going to be. Uh, as far as what the city has done to date, as far as the school system, where the school committee adopted a policy where teachers aren't enforcement officers, they're not federal officers, to enforce immigration in the school. The kids have a safe place to go where they can learn. Police officers, where their resources are already strained, are able to protect from criminals. Not immigration. They're not federal immigration officers. It's what the city's doing now. It's what the state supreme judicial court has ruled on. And I, like, I, like some of the colleagues have suggested, let's see where we go as a state and let's see where we go as a nation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by Eduardo Perez of the Lynn Worker Center and Rob Jello of the Painters Union. Come on up. And candidate Ladd will be the first person to answer this. My name is Laura Ramirez. Soy una, soy una residente. I'm a resident of Lynn. Y trabajadores de esta ciudad. And I'm, a, I'm a working in this city. Madre de cuatro hijos. A mother of four children. Que asist, y as, asistente. No. <laughs> Sorry. Que asisten las escuelas públicas de Lynn. A four children that assist the, uh, the Lynn public schools. Desde hace 14 años. Uh, for about 14 years. Y también soy miembro de la, de la, del Centro de Trabajadores. And a member of the Lean Worker Center. De Lean. Estoy aquí en no, nombre mío, de mi familia. I'm here on behalf of myself, of my families. Y otros miles de trabajadores. And thousands of workers uh, living here in Lynn que como yo vive su vida dignamente, like me, the living the the life in dignity, trabajando, working, uh, actualmente, working hard para ganar to win the bread, para ganarnos nuestro pan de cada día y a y a nombre de otros miles de trabajadores en on behalf of thousands of other workers residents of President Lynn, Lynn quienes han sido víctimas de robo de salario de, de parte de empleadores from uh, uh, employers no, 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 dueños no, no, de no, negocio no, no, business owners en esta ciudad en DC yo personalmente uh, me personally he sido víctima I have been a victim de robo de salario o wage theft. Trabajador, trabajé en I un work in a restaurant restaurante por casi for un mes. A month. Después me dijo el dueño que the owner told me to 
come back regresaría por otra vez por mi pago for my, for my pay. me cansé de esperar I up y al final me dio todavía me, me debe mi salario He still owes my salary. que trabajé dignamente that I worked dignity and dignity. dejando mis hijos Leaving my children en los fin, fin de semana alone on a weekend without, you know, working on the weekend estos empleadores these employers se salen con la de ellos they do what they want conocen los sistemas they know the systems y saben cómo hacerlo and they know how to, how to, how to stole people's wages es una injusticia this is a very this is an injustice que dejan a miles de familias living a thousands of families in the middle of the pobreza sin tener para darles de comer a mis a miles de niños to feed thousands of children in the city por la lo, Plotonería for the greediness de querer hacer to dinero to make money cam a cambio de explorar to explore a miles de personas thousands of people además a and violar las leyes and in, in addition violating the laws that are already que ya constituyen como ilegal estos actos that already makes it illegal uh, for uh, for the wage theft necesitamos we need que que todas las personas aquí we, sepan we need people to know here that estos abusos these abuses que cometen are being uh, are happening every a diario day y que no podemos dejar que and we should de pasar we should not let this thing on the side. Alto estos abusos, especially these abuses that are nuestros, happening. Nuestras families. familias dependiendo de nuestro salario. Mm -hmm. Our families depend on, the, on these salaries. Poder vivir to una vida digna, a, a life with dignity and respect. respect. Les pido que escuchen a mi compañero Eduardo quien va a explicarles lo siguiente. Gracias. I, I would like for you to listen to my co-worker, uh, to my uh, colleague Eduardo, who's going to uh, tell you the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Eduardo Pérez. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eduardo Pérez. Trabajo para el Link Worker Center. I work at the Link Worker Center. Estamos aquí esta noche porque queremos denunciar eh, cómo, se han to cómo se han incrementado los robos de salario en los dos últimos años. How the wage theft has increased in our city of Link lately. Más, de, más de 50 negocios de diferentes tamaños. More than 50 businesses um, around the city han entrado a la práctica de robo de salario. They have entered into the practice of stolen people's wages. Lo que nos lleva a formar parte de más de 350 millones de dólares en todo el estado por esta mala práctica. So we have lost about 350 millions of dollars in wage theft and revenue for the state. Una de las vías que ellos más usan One of the, of the ways that they use es el pago por debajo de la mesa, fuera de los libros. One of the ways that they use is to pay people under the table. Donde no solamente el trabajador pierde porque hay... Eh, eh, Where not bolsa, only the worker lo, uh, lo, lose. Sino que también el gobierno <coughs> deja de recibir esos impuestos. But also the government loses because they don't receive this revenue and income taxes or taxes paid to the government. En resumen... Hemos venido a hacer esta exposición aquí porque no tenemos un instrumento que nos permita judicializar esta mala práctica. En um, realidad, we are here because we want to present you what are the best ways that we think that we're working to and make this practice end in the city. Por eso queremos ponerle en la bandeja a uh, estos aspirantes. That's why we want to put you all in this table tonight. Nuestro proyecto de, orden, de ordenanza que nos permita pelear en los tribunales nuestros derechos. Our, our, our project to, uh, for, for the or, uh, wage ordinance 
to pass a wage state ordinance so we can stop these practices from local business and people that are living and working in this in this city. Quedamos en espera de sus respuestas. So we we'll wait for your response. Thank you. Pretty much the same question, just not broken up. <coughs> so in the last two years, about 50 Lynn businesses have had wage theft complaints filed against them. Companies of all sizes are guilty of not paying their workers for their labor. And a majority of below wage workers do not get their earned pay. Wage theft includes paying below minimum wage, not paying holiday or overtime wages, refusing to earn sick time, and flat out not paying people at all. Over 350 million of Massachusetts wages have been stolen by employees in 2017 alone. This wage theft also costs millions in tax revenue and punishes honest businesses that pay according to the law. Do you support a wage theft ordinance in Lynn? Why? or why not? What would you leverage to keep bad employees in check and accountable? For example, if a city contractor or business that needs a license from the city is found guilty of wage theft, my voice is there. They will still be allowed to operate in our city? That's a question. Thanks, guys. Under normal, thank you all very much for the question. Under normal circumstances, I'm very uncomfortable going first on the question, but being a business owner in the city of Lansing, this is a problem for me, actually. Uh, and, and, and being a business owner in the city of Lansing, that just gives honest business owners like myself a very terrible reputation. Uh, the fact that workers are not being paid the wages that they're entitled to, at the very least minimum wage, not earning earned sick time, not being paid holiday time, it, it's, it's appalling and it's actually extremely disturbing. So clearly it is a huge issue. Um, and I'll be totally honest, I did not know that there was 50 businesses in the city that have already been reported for in 2017. So I learned something tonight as well. Absolutely, I, I agree with the wage theft ordinance in the city. To what degree? Probably a little early to, to tell on that for me to make a complete decision on that, um, but I absolutely would feel that it should be a monetary punishment, uh, you know, whether it's a one-shot deal, twice, three times you're out. Businesses like myself have to file for a uh, home improvement contractor license, uh, business certificates, building permits. If you're stealing the wages of your staff, theft is theft. Um, you should be out of business, is my, in my opinion. That makes us all look terrible. So in a short answer, I don't even think I need the entire two minutes. I, absolutely, I do support it, and I think it should be a monetary punishment. Hit them in the pocket where it hurts. If that doesn't work, the licenses are pulled. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for the stories from our sister and Eduardo and, and Rob. Uh, it's atrocious what's happening out there in the underground economy and with wage theft. And I absolutely, 100% will stand by you as a champion on this issue. I will do whatever I can within my power of City Council to make sure that not only are we working with the AG's office at the state level, and Maura Healy is keeping people accountable, but there are so many that she has to get to in each and every community. Of the 351 communities in this state, there are many that are doing this practice. And it's a shame. And we should stop it from the get-go. It happens with tip workers, it happens with service and restaurants, it happens in different industries like our pages over here. It's, a, it's prevalent all over the state. It's running rampant, especially in the city of Lynn. We need to know those 50 plus businesses right now, it's a public record. We need to get our city solicitor's office involved in the dialogue at the state level with Maury Ely to work to not only curb that, but to eliminate it. And if we aren't doing that on the subcommittee level, please, please come to us. I am part of the license committee, I'm on ordinance, I'm on public safety, I'm on a lot of these subcommittees that I can help with. I have not heard of the prevalence of, of, of it being so widespread in the city of Lynn, and I'm ashamed and embarrassed of that. And there's no way that our family should be suffering like this, day in, day, in, day out, putting in an honest day's work, hard work pay, and not getting compensated for holidays or overtime 
or earned sick time. It's atrocious that employees will behave this way, and they knew they knew they do need to be held accountable. So I will do whatever I can from my power of city councilor to work effectively with uh, the, the New Worker Center, the Newland Coalition, and labor itself to make sure that we eradicate bad business people from providing in the city of Lynn. Thank you. I'm just like my colleagues right here. I'm 100% um, behind uh, the Ezra Miller for the uh, great plan. Um, we are fighting for $15 an hour, and we still have a hard time. And 50% of the Hopeliners have a hard time paying for their rent. And there's no way we cannot allow these 50 companies to do this to our workers. I will use whatever I can in my power as a city councilor, like uh, Brian said. I said a lot of uh, committees, uh, um, committees uh, in the uh, city council. I will work with my, my councilors, uh, fellow councilor, at the state level, to set up an ordinance to make sure that um, we uh, to make sure that we promote. Uh, this uh, accountability uh, among the companies who, uh, who steal um, uh, money from, from our workers. And I cannot, I cannot uh, stress enough because I'm very angry too because I have uh, worked with a lot of people who struggle every day and, and we understand and we know. So uh, I will stand behind our workers and do what we can to make sure this company are uh, held accountable and we will make sure that the uh, people can and uh, and I need uh, ISP to do what they can to uh, punish these people to make sure they do not practice this kind of uh, game again. And um, I uh, cannot stress enough, so I'm 100% behind this and we do what we can from our power and from the state legislature and we work together to make sure this company are accountable. Thank you. Thank Well, being in business for nearly 35 years, you know, my family has, has, has best practices. We take care of our employees. I go to my restaurant right now. I have young employees and I have women, girls that have worked for me for over 10 years. Single moms, I work with them around their schedules. A good employer does that. Um, you hire a payroll company, and a payroll company will pay them what they're supposed to be paid. Nothing below. I thought that was really the common practice. Take care of your employees. And if they, they, they're better, you pay them way above the minimum wage if they, if they deserve it. Um, this is new to me. I didn't hear about 50 businesses until tonight, which is shocking to me. Um, that's something that I want to look into. Do I support an ordinance? The question is, I will support an ordinance, but I have to see it. I can't support something I haven't seen. I want to support an ordinance that actually creates prosperous growth, too. Imagine if we find 50 businesses and we end up suffering and end up closing. What does that mean to the economy? That has an impact on the economy as well. What happens if someone from, say, uh, Market Basket gets an unfair practice? What are we going to do? Are we going to punish Market Basket? That's what we do. Well, we can punish them. That's right. But we're not. We, with the small businesses, it could be opening and closing their doors. They should be. They, we should find out what's going on with these small businesses, what the problem is, and, and go from there. But I, I, this is new to us tonight that 50 businesses were, you know, stealing wages from people. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Field. Thank you for this question. Thank you for this question. Um, these, these questions were emailed to us a couple of days ago, and the one thing that stood out to me, and I'm glad it was mentioned today, that this is abuse. Okay, it's abuse by the employee. The word abuse wasn't in the email, and that was the first word that came to mind, and I'm glad that you used that word because that's clearly what this is. It's an abuse by the employer against the employee. If it's happening, in our city, it's an embarrassment. I, it, it certainly had to, 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 to follow Council Lapierre, um, but he's a champion in this, and, and I can't echo his words enough. Um, I certainly support an ordinance to eradicate this in our city. I would like to work with the state to continue to, for, for them to assist us in eradicating this type of behavior, these type of actions, this type of abuse that's happening to good people putting in an honest day's work. Thank you. Candidate Figueroa. It's a simple equation with a simple solution. 
if you work, you should be properly compensated. It's the way the world works. I know the local carpenters union 26 is working tirelessly working towards curbing this wage theft issue that we have here. What are we doing here? Can we do more? Of course we can do more. We can always do more. I can tell you that as your counselor at large, any company that does business in Lynn will be ethical and will always be held accountable to our standards. I guarantee it. Let's create this ordinance as a city council. That's what we do. We create policy to protect the greater good of our people and the citizens of Lynn. So if it takes us to go after them with ISD, accompany them in their car to make sure we're going and getting after these businesses to pay these people their proper wages, then let's do it. Let's get out to work. You guys are elected us so we can protect you and serve you, not the other way around. So come to me. My cell phone number is on the palm card. I leave at everyone's house. Why? Because I'm going to be open, I'm going to be accessible, and I'm going to be transparent. And I'm going to hold it up there with integrity of that office. And I'm going to make sure that you guys are properly compensated, taken care of, and represented on the City Council. Thank you. Our third question tonight will be asked by Paul Coombs of Neighbor to Neighbor and Millie Cruz of Lynn United for Change. And candidate LaPierre will take this question first. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mila Cruz, and I'm part of Lynn United for Change. I live in Lynn, and I have a lot of family here. I love the city, and I love the people. Like over half of the residents of Lynn, and also a renter. And a good tenant. I've been living in my residence for almost five years now. And I overpaid my rent on time. Great tenant. But last year, my landlord tried to beat me just because he wanted to sell the building. And he thought he could make more money if it's a house was him. Since then, I've been looking for a new apartment. It's really hard. I want to stay in Lynn but I just cannot find anything that is affordable. I feel like I'm being forced to live somewhere else. And I am not the only one having a problem finding an affordable place. I know people who are already being pushed out of the city because they cannot find a home. They are being forced to go to another city and start all over again. They're being forced to leave their family and their friends and the city they love. And I might be one of those people very soon if I cannot find a place. Or I may, it might be you or someone you love. Right now, 57% of living renters pay too much for housing. I have seen people getting rent increases up to $200 or $300 per month, or even more. It's obvious that we need more affordable housing. New apartments are being built right now on the lower Washington Street. The New Lynn Coalition get, get a community benefit agreement for this project. That means it's being built by union workers and will include affordable apartments. But on the other side of the laneway, in the Beacon Chevy project, it will have about 350 apartments. Not even one of those apartments will be affordable. They are going to have rents around 2200 per month. That means nothing for us. Nothing for the hardworking people struggling to stay in this city like me. And down the lingway near Warmer in the gear plant site, is, it will have one over 1,000 apartments. None of them will be affordable. Nothing. I'm going to be, it's going to be a gated community so people from the rest of the link will be excluded. We need all of the new projects to include some affordable apartment to help with the housing crisis. So what can we do? An inclusionary zoning ordinance will help. It will make sure that new project has some apartments that are affordable for moderate and lower income from people from Lynn. Thank you. Follow up, we have a three part question. 
Uh, do you support an inclusionary zoning ordinance in order to assure all in residents, including working families and the community of color, have affordable housing? What specifically will you do to enact such an ordinance? And should the uh, rates be set accordingly to the income levels of Lynn? For instance, if uh, current statistics show over 50% of Lynn residents need assistance, should that be the level that we aim for for affordable housing? Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Millie from Neighbor to Neighbor. Uh, so on the issue of housing, it is way too expensive around, uh, not only in Lynn, but in surrounding communities, and Lynn is actually, believe it or not, a little cheaper if you look around uh, comparatively to the North Shore cities and towns around us. And it's not a bargain here. The costs are very high to survive. Many people are spending up to 70% of their monthly income on housing and just to being afford to stay in an apartment. I think of Jose Palma on Summer Street. I think of many of you in this audience that are being priced out of Lynn. And I absolutely sympathize and understand all of the issues around it, and I'm trying to learn more as we go. I believe things like the Gateway Project are very valuable, public-private partnerships that have affordable housing built in. We're similarly doing that at the Thurgood Marshall Middle School Project that's going out to bid right now for affordable housing that will be senior, over 55 and over. Um, but there aren't enough, there is not enough housing in stock for the population that Lynn serves. So we have to be creative, and we have to be a help on this. We are doing a fair share through Lynn Housing, and through building infill housing and things of that nature. I will certainly support an inclusionary zoning ordinance if it comes before the city council in the next term. I will uh, work very diligently to enact that and help write that with the, with the uh, Lynn United for Change folks. And I will be a champion on this cause for you. Because I came late to the party on Beacon Chevrolet. Had I been there in the beginning in 2014 and 2013, I think things could have went a little differently. I did get you folks a seat at the table with Minko after I got lambasted in the paper for coming out and saying we needed affordable housing. And I took the hit my first three weeks in office for New Lynn Coalition and Neighbor to Neighbor and every other organization that's in this room. And I'm proud of that because you are the people that put me in office and I'm there to serve you so you will always have a seat at the table under my administration as city councilor. Thank you. This question is very really important. I know what is done is already done and we cannot turn around. But from from now on, move forward. So if before we approve any uh, developer to build any houses or any um, uh, buildings, we have to uh, make sure the affordable housing included here before we approve that. And as I know that right now, uh, affordable housing, we have uh, what's about 22%, 22.9% in national city. And uh, I uh, have a meeting with the uh, Lynn Housing Authority. It's not enough. We still need more because 50% of our residents are paying, uh, cannot afford to pay rent. I have to stress that again. So we do need more of this. And I wholeheartedly support the inclusive uh, zoning from today on. What do we do? We make sure that every building has a um, um, uh, affordable housing in there. And uh, the Washington Project is a mixing affordable housing and also microbate as well. So we have to do that as well. And, um, so, like um, my colleague said, so we will do what we can to make sure the residents get involved in this before we make any decision. So, we do all the work. We, we need to represent you. We want to make sure you are part of this decision making as part of our, our my campaign, part of my uh, my philosophy. So if we work together, there's nothing will go wrong. If we, if we go wrong, we go wrong together so that there's no one will get blamed. So let me and my colleagues continue to push hard to make sure before we do anything, just make sure you, we are happy together. So we are one, one big city, one big family. Thank you so much for the question. No, I do not support inclusionary zoning. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Lynn already falls in compliance with 40B. That means that Lynn is over 25% affordable housing and moving up. Inclusionary zoning is for other cities and towns that are not carrying their weight, like Marblehead, like Swampskin. 
Those are the cities that include inclusionary zoning. They're the ones with the new development they should take on. We cannot take on Boston's housing crisis alone. We've been doing that for 40 years, and we're still suffering as a city. This is what I want to do. Instead of adding more housing, what I want to do is to update the zoning. Instead of the 1,250 apartments or the 2,000 apartments that they're promising the city, is bringing new manufacturing and jobs in the city. Because you know what? Even if you get paid $15 an hour, you're still going to have to work 85 hours a week and 90 hours a week to get by in a limited apartment. That's not going to help you. What I want to do is I want to empower, I want to empower generation, bringing new manufacturing, innovation through trade. That's what we need to do. It's happening all over Europe. I can give you a free or cheap place to stay. Is that going to empower you? How about if I train you, give you the education, give you the pathways, like my, like my immigrants, like we came here. We had opportunities here. You don't have opportunity for just housing. We need jobs. The service jobs in the city are not cutting it. We can't survive. I, I know that. I've seen people that work for me that make $15, $16 an hour that are struggling. We need to bring those $25 an hour jobs, those $30 an hour jobs through training. We can do that. We have to turn the culture of the city. We cannot continue down this path. Yes, we can build more housing through innovation. Build up. Build with density. Yes, I'm not saying no to that. But we can't have inclusionary zoning. We have to be more creative. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very difficult topic because of so many different reasons why rent has risen over the past number of years. One reason is because Boston vouchers. It, it allows a family from Boston to, to come to Lynn and reap the benefits and the landlords of these apartments, these limited apartments that are available, uh, are certainly going to accept that voucher where it pays more. And that's certainly a challenge here at the Housing Authority, where they have families that they're trying to serve here in Lynn. It becomes a, a, a taxing issue where it's, it's, a, it's, it's an entire family that the city is now serving that really has no base here in the community, where they, they're just being displaced from probably their own families, likely their own families from Boston. Increased fees that are passed on to, to homeowners, to, to landlords, are getting passed on to renters, okay? To, to deal with budgetary issues, trash fees that was just adopted this past year. Those are all simple, small solutions to a bigger problem. Until we figure out what fiscally is wrong with this city, fees are gonna only increase rent for those that can't afford it. Those are the real issues. So we need to look at how many different issues are all affecting this one general issue. The, the Washington Street Project, it, it, it's, it's amazing that a private and public support can all come together to have this agreement. It benefits one another. I would like to see more of that. Um, I believe it's the relationships that people share, not just locally, but, but at the state level to, to reach out to, to labor unions. And, and to private landowners themselves to, to negotiate what's, what's best for the community. And, and, and it's certainly a, lo a loaded question, but the, the, there are so many components that, that, that are the real reason for, for these high rents. Thank you. Thank you. Point period. Developers shouldn't be receiving blank checks. I'm a firm advocate in favor of community benefit packages and agreements. I am a product of displacement, and I have always vowed to protect people from it. Working apart class apartments are crucial for our college graduates starting in life. Take a public school teacher's salary, starting here in Lynn, is $40,000 a year. Rent's supposed to be 30%, at least you can afford $1,005 a year. The new building in downtown Lynn, for a one-bedroom apartment, you're looking at $1,500 a month. That's $18,000 a year, that's 45% of her income spent on, on rent. That's unacceptable. For a college graduate that's dedicating her entire career to teaching our children, who are we to say that they can't live in Lynn? To say that we don't need it is like telling our teacher that her services are unappreciated. That is not the Lynn I know and I know we can do better. To answer your question, absolutely. We as a city government should be looking to ensuring our working class people have a place to stay right here that they always have and have a place to live and call home. Lynn is their home. Absolutely. Boston does it. Boston has its 
of all new residential development requires 13% of affordable housing. Well, I'm proposing that here for this city, we need 15% across the board for all new residential development. It's not saying if it comes to my table. No, it's being out there, being an advocate for it, and bringing it to the table as your next city councilor at large. That's what we need to do. That's inclusionary zoning. It's not just for low-income people. It's for a college graduate who's teaching our children. Let's take that yes. and look at that for that, what it is. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Inclusionary zoning is a difficult topic for a city that is already $8 million in debt with no immediate fix in sight. <clears throat> My firm belief that development and land over the next few years and next several years should be commercial development. <coughs> commercial investors, it'll increase our commercial tax base. As a business owner, a real estate broker, and land, trust me, I really realize the need for affordable housing. However, with a city that currently has such a scale of affordable housing, we need to tip that scale. We also need commercial development. We can't just simply say, yes, we, we, we agree or disagree with the inclusionary zoning. It, it's not that simple. Because ultimately, this is the reason, you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of middle of the road with everybody up here on the, on, the, uh, on the topic. And I think my real estate background is kind of what's keeping me middle of the aisle on this one. The city can't fund affordable housing, we're $8 million in debt, we, it, we, we have inclusionary zoning, and now we can't get a commercial investor to put a shovel on the ground because they don't want it. We have to have a happy balance here someplace, and the and, and fact of the matter is, I agree that it starts with education. If we have more commercial developers investing in the city of Lynn, and, and bringing businesses to Lynn, and increasing the job base in Lynn, we can work to close the funding gap on our police and fire departments and include funding towards our education. Education is ultimately where it's going to start. If you have workforce training, you know, we, have, we have Lynn Tech, uh, beautiful programs there. We have beautiful high schools. Lynn Public Schools are wonderful. If we could increase on our STEM programs there and our workforce programs to increase the job base in Lynn and increase the, uh, the, the, the wage in Lynn, it's a trickle effect. It really is. We get the commercial developers to come in, they, they, they build. We have better jobs. We have funding for our schools. We have funding for closing the an $8 million funding gap without just saying a blanket, yes, we need inclusionary zoning. That's not the answer. It's not going to help. There's a trickle effect. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Could we have a round of applause for our candidates? All right, this is the lightning round, <laughs> okay? We're gonna begin with Hong Nat and go real quick. We want a yes or a no, a yes or a no. There are two options and they are yes or no. Does everyone understand? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> okay, candidate Nat, if you are elected, Will you vote in favor of a wage theft ordinance, yes or no? Yes. Candidate Nicola, Nicola Coppolis. Uh, yes. Candidate Field? Yes. Candidate Figueroa? Absolutely. Candidate Ladd? Yes. And Candidate LaPierre? 100%. Thank you. If you are elected, yes. will you vote in support of an inclu inclusionary zoning ordinance, yes or no? Candidate Matt? Yes. Nicola Coppola? No. Field? Yes. Figueroa? This was wage step, right? No. This no. is inclusionary oh, zoning. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm going to pay attention. Yes. <laughs> Lad? No. And LaPierre? Yes. And our final quick round question. If you are elected, will you support a sanctuary city ordinance, yes or no? Candidate Nat? Yes. Nicola Coppolis? No. Field? <laughs> sanctuary city? <laughs> 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 I, have, I know this is not a yes or no question. I have to see the explanation from, from the corner office. Right Thank there. you. Figueroa? Well, Given this city's history yes of immigrants, yes or no? Wait, yes wait, or no? The city's 
history of immigrants, not only the city of the United States, from Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants. Yes or no? Come on. Yes. What was the answer? Okay, thank you. Not yet. <laughs> All right, we are going to move on to our closing statement from our candidates. But first, I want to thank some people who have worked to put this evening together. I want to thank the planning team of the New Lynn Coalition. I want to thank the North Shore Labor Council, Neighbor to Neighbor, Mass Senior Action, ECHO. I want to thank Maria Carrasco, Juan Gonzalez, Eduardo Perez, Rob Jelly, <laughs> Paul Coombs, and Millie Cruz. We'd like to thank um, Lynn Housing Authority and Neighborhood Development for this space. We'd like to thank Lynn Happening for recording the event tonight. And I want to remind you that you can find that recording via YouTube on lynnhappens.com. I'd like to thank our translators, Isabel Lopez of the Lynn Worker Center and Elsa Bellman Cullen. There are four counselor at large positions, and there are eight candidates for these four positions. Election day is Tuesday, November 7th, and the polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Now, we will have our closing statements, beginning with candidate Nicola Kopoulos. You will have one minute. Again, thank you for having me here tonight. 43 years ago, my parents came here with two, two pieces of luggage, two children, with not a dream. They just wanted to educate us. My father told me, he goes, I came from a country and I was something. I came to America and I started at zero. I know how that's like. I know how that's like not seeing your father on weekends working 80, 90 hours and you, both your parents having dropped off the babysitter to babysitter. I was that child. I was that child in the, in the shopping carriage pushing down Union Street. Okay? I'm proud of what I am today because I have two great parents that were workers and they had opportunity. I want to go back to that city. I want to go back to that city where immigrants could find jobs and work and, and actually buy a home and raise a family because I'm an example of that. That's who I am. Go look at the soup. I'll be working tomorrow morning at my restaurant at 8.30 in the morning cleaning grease traps and pots and pans seven days a week because that's what I am. I'm a worker. Thank Please vote for me on November 7th. Thank, Thank you. you. together we can we can make this place better we can make this city better not just better but we can make it the best we can make this place not just a, a city to uh, a city to live in but but to, but to prosper a place not to settle for but settle in encourage local businesses that are here to remain here welcome new businesses and new families into the city and, and together we can do this. And I respectfully ask for one of your four votes on November 7th so that I can be your voice uh, on the City Council. Thank you very much. Well, I'm running for, con for, con for Council at Large to give kids like me hope. Sorry. To give kids like you guys hope. To give your parents hope. I hope that you can always bounce back and that your past doesn't define you, your intentions do. To hope that the examples of my successes and the examples of my failure can be a beacon of inspiration to people in our community. I'm serving, I'm running for council at large to serve all the people of Lynn with integrity, passion, and to be accessible and transparent. We need to make sure that all the interests in the people of Lynn are being heard, addressed, and acted upon every single day. I am that counselor. I will fight to, for everyone and everyone's equal, equitable stake in our community. 
to make sure that Lynn rises and progresses with its people and we don't invite others to be the new Lynners. I'm running to be a council at large again to represent you. And I'm humbly asking for one of your votes for council at large on November 7th. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it, having you, you having me here tonight. It, it, it's, it's truly an honor. And I do realize that I am not naive to the fact that we don't all agree on everything. Um, and I don't think that we're going to. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the beauty of a diverse city. It really is. Um, my hope is that you'll actually leave here tonight, though, with a solid understanding of what my values and goals are for the city. Just because my view is different from your view, doesn't make either one of us right or wrong. It's diversity. We need a little more diversity. We need business owners and real estate brokers and people that understand the actual development of the city. I'm not saying that the minds that are on there don't. We're looking to join, we're looking to help, we're looking to, to be a different voice on the, on, on the city council. And that's the main reason for me running. Putting my business background to use for all of you. That, we do it every day for a living. Why, why shouldn't it be offered to you? <laughs> My name is John Ladd. I'm running for Councilor at Large. I'm number seven on the ballot, and I respectfully ask for one of your four votes. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, New Lynn Coalition, for hosting this uh, very informative forum. Uh, I'm proud to have been endorsed by the North Shore Labor Council and Neighbor to Neighbor, who are part of this, uh, affiliated with this organization. Lynn means everything to me, and it's time to take this city to new heights. I was born and raised here. I've spent my life working to make it a better place. I'm running for re-election as your counselor at large to make our neighborhood safer, create local jobs, and respond to your concerns. As your city councilor, I've responded to over 1,000 constituent requests, fighting to make Lynn neighborhood safer and cleaner, and to maintain public services for our residents. But there's still more work to do. I'm running to be the person that helps all residents, from lifelong Lynners to those who may have just moved here three months ago. Advance in this city, whether you're going to school here, whether you're raising a family here, or starting a business. I'm Brian Lopp here, and I respectfully ask for one of your four votes on Tuesday, November 7th. Thank you. Thank you again for having me here tonight. Um, I just want to let you know that I work hard every day to make sure everyone have a, a good life in this city. I register over 1,000 people to vote because they want to uh, participate in the voting process. These people are the people who never uh, had a chance to uh, get involved in politics or in the, in the government. And if those people are, have the chance to go to city hall, walk to the city hall, they're not afraid anymore because of me. I have opened the door for them. And I see that a lot of people are running for office as well because they know that I could do so, they think they can do too. And I'm very proud for that. I'm also a proud father and husband, and I want to do the best for my family and also the best for our family in this city. That's what I do every day. I only want to ask for one of four votes on November 7, so I can continue to serve you and serve our city and the best that uh, I can. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Tonight, and I neglected to give thanks to John Feinberg, who has provided our, our sound system. And I think we are going to finish up tonight with the Thank you. 